Meet my Redeemer. And I trust that you had a quiet afternoon, or as best you could, and uh, some perhaps uh, didn't get to see the afternoon, but uh, by way of sleep, that's all right. But uh, as we gather tonight, let's turn our attention to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let us stand. We'll sing My Redeemer, verses 1, 2, and 3. sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love to me. On the cruel cross he suffered, from the curse to set me free. Sing, oh sing of my Redeemer, with his blood he purchased me. Wonderful truth to think that with his blood he purchased me, paid my debt, amen, and paid your debt on the cross and made us free. And what a wonderful truth that is. Well, it's uh, good to have you here tonight. I'm going to ask Brother Bob, would you lead us in a word of prayer to start? Amen. Pastor Pooley. Okay, let's turn to number 377. 377. Now this is, this is one that's caused confusion from time to time. We recognize stand up for Jesus, but... 377 is to a different tune, and so I trust that there's some here that know it, and you can help out with it, and the rest of you, well, hopefully you can pick it up as we go, but this is a different tune, so don't be caught off guard here, okay? <laughs> It's my 
strife will not be long. This day the noise of battle, the next the victor's song. To him that overcometh, the crown of life shall be. sung to that tune before. There's a few, that's good. Had a little support here, but uh, that's one that's been there, but I don't think we've, I think we've maybe sung that tune once or twice. And so maybe we'll try to do that one a little more often, but Amen. stand up for Jesus. It must not suffer loss. His royal banner must not suffer loss. And you know what? It won't suffer loss, will it? The victory's already been won. And so praise the Lord for his victory. Let's turn to number 365. 365, this one I'm sure is much more familiar. Are ye able, said the master. So we'll sing the first and last verses. 365. said the master to be crucified with me yea the sturdy dreamers answered to the death we follow strength are we nope. but only in his strength and so he has a work for us to do well, let's have a look at our announcements and so what's coming up well lord willing we'll be meeting on wednesday evening at seven o'clock for our midweek prayer and bible study so be sure to join us for that and then of course coming up next sunday is our regular services and so be praying about that be praying that we'll have visitors come and uh, you know what, uh, we even have visitors online, and so that's, that's always exciting too. And pray that the Lord will work in, in hearts, right? And that we might see some soul come to know Christ. So that's always something to be praying for, right? And then coming up March 24th, and so mark it on your calendar, March 24th, Wednesday evening, 7 o'clock, 
is our annual business meeting, okay? So we'd like to have as many of our members here as possible for that. And so I believe that's all we have for announcements. And so let's turn to number 256, 256 in our hymnals. <clears throat> It is well with my soul. And so let's stand together as we sing. Great old hymn of the faith. It's hard. Is the second or third verse more, more thrilling? It's really hard to say, isn't it? Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. What an amazing thing that is, isn't it? An amazing thing. And when we realize how unworthy we are and how worthy he is to be praised and how unworthy he was to do that. He didn't, he didn't have to do that, did he? He was sinless. And so praise the Lord for what Jesus did for us. But let's sing on that third verse and what happened to our sin? Well, let's sing about it on the third. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is there.
I do just want to mention that we will, if I could get about five minutes with the deacons tonight right after the service, I would uh, appreciate a couple of minutes. Uh, Colossians chapter 1 is where I would like for you to turn tonight. Colossians chapter 1. I've titled tonight's message, Walking Worthy of Our Witness. Did you realize that as born-again believers, having put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we have a witness, whether we try to or make an effort at it or not, uh, and really, as a born-again believer, it should not take a lot of effort. But sometimes we do have to to think about it and work at it a bit, but whether we realize it or not, we are putting forth a witness. Now, that witness may be a good witness or a bad one. Another way I could put that, of course, is a testimony. And I'm not talking about, you know, there's uh, certain times we will have uh, singspirations. We haven't done that in some time. Uh, Or we'll have a, a blessing evening and just have people share blessings of what's been going on in their life or ask them to share their testimony of what God has been doing. But we're talking about our, our testimony or our witness. In other words, the impact that our lives and our behavior is having on other people, particularly the unsaved world. In other words, when somebody looks at you, what do they see? When somebody watches your behavior, what do they witness? You know, we, we all, everything we do every day, Uh, Our actions, our speech, our conversation, uh, everything about us will tell a story about us when people are looking on us. And let me tell you, if you claim to be a born-again believer, people do watch your behavior. Sadly enough, a lot of times, uh, unsaved people are looking to watch you mess up or to see how you might falter so that individuals might be able to uh, find accusation against you. I think of it in the scriptures with, uh, I believe it was a week or two ago, we talked about uh, Daniel, the prophet Daniel. And you remember how the, uh, the princes of the day, they were jealous of Daniel's position and authority that he had been given, jealous of his walk before God. And so therefore, they were paying extra attention to him. And they discovered that, you know what, that Daniel, you can't find fault with him. Because they knew that Daniel walked before the Lord. It wasn't that he was perfect. It's just that he was conscious of and he strived to live righteous before God. Amen? And therefore, at the end of the day, you know, they came to the conclusion that we're not going to find fault with his relationship with his God. And so instead of trying to find accusation against him, they shifted their attention to uh, finding accusation against God himself, his worship of God. And that's why they brought in that decree, you know, nobody will worship anybody but the leader of the day. We have in our walk daily a witness or a testimony, people may observe our behavior, which actually puts, kind of puts a lot of pressure on us, doesn't it, when you, when you stop and think about it. It, it. it puts pressure on us to be thinking, well, what, what are people going to think? But you know what makes it real easy is when we are transparent. In other words, when we come to church and we sit in the pews and we greet one another and we listen to the Word of God and we sing the songs that we sing... You know, we, we do a pretty good job of having a testimony of being a born-again believer, amen? And it's easy because we're amongst fellow believers, but it's just important that when we walk out the door and we head home in our cars and we go to work on Monday or we go to the store or whatever it is we do each day throughout the week, that 
that witness or that, that, that behavior, that testimony is transparent. In other words, it, it, for a born-again believer, it should not change, should it? We shouldn't just be spiritually behaved and spiritually minded on Sunday and then be totally different from Monday through to Saturday. Because that's not the work of the Holy Spirit, is it? That's not the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you look at the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is an indication of a, a, an individual that's growing in the Lord, our behavior, uh, our testimony should be consistent, no matter where we are, no matter what we do, whether we're in the privacy of our own home with our family or if we're out in the public and seeing other people. In Colossians here, Paul deals with this. When you look down at, uh, let's go to Colossians chapter 1. We'll start in verse 1 there and read down to verse 14. We're going to focus on 12 to 14, but it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all saints, for the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth of the gospel, which is come unto you as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you, since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk, he says, worthy here of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. You know, it's God's desire that we would walk worthy, as he says here, of the Lord unto all pleasing. Now, we recognize that in and of ourselves, we're not worthy to God, are we? Now, God loves us. The point being is, anything we do to, to, to try to get into God's good graces apart from salvation, apart from the Lord Jesus Christ... You know, the scriptures tell us that, that we're not worthy enough to obtain uh, God's uh, attention or, or, or to, uh, you know, please God if we haven't trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior. We're only made worthy through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're made worthy by the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary and Jesus paying for our sins and uh, changing us so that we are worthy, not because of ourselves, but worthy because Jesus Christ is our Savior. Amen? And so he says here that we ought to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work. Verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks, he says, unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. And what he's saying there in verse 12 is that Jesus Christ is the one who has made us worthy, amen? He has made us partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. You know, God wants us to walk worthy. He wants us to have a witness and a testimony that's consistent with our relationship that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives three reasons here why we ought to walk worthy, and the first one is this. We ought to walk worthy because God has made us his children through the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 12, uh, verse 13. He, has, he says, uh, going back to verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers, made us worthy of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. 
So three things we're going to see in this passage. The first one in verse 12, as he says there that he has made us partakers of the inheritance of the saints. In other words, he's given us access to the inheritance of his children. And of course, his children began really with, uh, we know, with Abraham for sure. And we become, you know, part of the family of Abraham through our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says we're adopted into God's family. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. God wants us to walk worthy because he has made us his children. He has adopted us into his family. John chapter 1 and verse 12 but as many as received him. And who, who is he talking about there? Those that have received him? Born again, born again believers, exactly. But as many as have received him, to them gave he power to become the what? Sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. By our relationship through the Lord Jesus Christ, by faith, we are adopted into God's family. And that is a special privilege. Because <clears throat> God's family is a special family, amen? God's family is unique from every other family that's out there. We look to the scriptures, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, he tells us here in verse, seven, uh, verse uh, 17, Romans chapter 8 and verse 17. Actually, you start in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the what? The sons of God. Again, pointing to the fact that we're by faith in Jesus Christ and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we are made the sons of God. For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. And the Spirit itself speareth, uh, beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. In other words, the Holy Spirit confirms with our spirit that because of our relationship in Jesus Christ, we are his children. We can truly, our, truly call ourselves the children of God. And in verse 17, and if children, he says, if we're children, then we are what? Heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, we may also be glorified together. The adoption that we have into God's family through the Lord Jesus Christ make us, makes us heirs to God. And of course, that comes with special blessing when we think about what the heirs of God will receive. The heirs of God will receive the same promises that God has made to Abraham. And you go back to uh, Genesis 12 and go back to the book of Genesis in general. You know, there's a number of promises that has been made to Abraham, and they're wonderful promises, and we get to be partakers of those. Now, there are some promises that God has made that are reserved for specifically the nation of Israel that will not be given to us, but there are lots of promises that God has made to all those that are called his children. Eternal life, a home in heaven, the, having the opportunity to, to reign with Christ in the eternity. That's only a few to mention of the many that God has made. He has made us heirs of God. Not only heirs of God, but as he says there in verse 18, co-heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Which is hard for us to wrap our head around sometimes, isn't it? Considering that Jesus Christ is the divine Son of God. But when you understand, when you look to the, and we won't look at this tonight, but when you look to the role that uh, the church will play, we know that in the end days, the church will be raptured, from the world, 
Are you looking forward to that day? Could happen today, amen? And when we're raptured from the church, the scriptures tell us that we will be the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's, uh, that's go going to be, I presume, you know, an amazing opportunity to be the bride of Christ. How that's going to work out, we don't know. We're not given the details, but it is a wonderful promise of God. But that's, you know, we think of ourselves, as he mentions here at verse 17, joint heirs with Christ. We'll be joint heirs through the salvation we have in Christ, through the fact that we will be the bride of Christ. And not only that, but we'll be heirs of the promise. Galatians chapter 3. Turn over there for a moment. Galatians chapter 3. And verse 29, he says, And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And again, we're, we're adopted as into God's family. We're adopted in and become children. In other words, we're not just slaves serving God. Now, God calls us to serve him, doesn't he? We'll serve him in this life, or we ought to be serving him faithfully in this life. I believe we will be serving and worshiping him in heaven, but not just simply as slaves to, to do his work and and that's all we will do. No, we're going to have a wonderful relationship with God by our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, walk worthy because God has adopted us as his children. That's the first reason why we ought to walk worthy. The question is, how do we do that? How do we walk worthy? How do we walk with a proper testimony that bears witness of the fact that we have a relationship with God. We're more than just his creation. We recognize when you look at 1 Peter, turn to 1 Peter for a moment. First Peter chapter 1, sorry, First Peter chapter 2, First Peter chapter 2, Peter describes us here when he says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, and a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. No, we're, we're a chosen generation. We're a royal priesthood. We've been made, we think of Jesus Christ, who is presently our high priest, seated at the right hand of the Father, and we've been adopted into God's family. We're adopted into a royal family, amen? And of course, with that comes a number of privileges, but, it all, but with that also comes a responsibility, doesn't it? And so when God wants us to walk worthy of the witness that we have, we need to walk as children of God. How do we do that? Well, we walk as part of God's royal family. In other words, our, 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 the things we do, the things we say, the places we go to ought to be governed by the word of God. Individuals that are uh, that would be referred to as commoners, if you like, in, in society, and that marry into a royal family, there's an expectation that they will that they can't just be the same old people that they used to be. Because there's an expectation from that uh, society where that royal family lives. And we don't see that too much here in Canada, but Certainly with our ties to Britain, we see that with the royal family in, in Britain, is that there's, a, there's an expectation by the public that if you are uh, part of the royal family, 
especially if you've been born into the royal family, there's an expectation that they're going to behave in a certain way. And when they don't behave in a certain way, there's a lot of kind of public ridicule brought upon them and, and, and attacks. And, of course, there's, there's usually some, some type of uh, punishment, even from within the royal family, right, that comes upon them when they don't behave a certain way. But especially when, you know, you, you come in from, from outside, there's an expectation that you're going to be different because you're representing that family. Well, when we think of our relationship with God, we're, we're adopted into his family. God's family is a, you know, from a spiritual point of view, a royal family based on, you know, Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords. And therefore, God has an expectation for, for our walk, doesn't he? So if we're to walk worthy of our witness, if we're to walk as part of God's royal family... We need to learn how to do it, don't we? And that's where, that's where the Word of God becomes so important for us. We're not going to learn to walk according to representing God's family well if we are not in the Word of God studying it for ourselves. Or at the very least, reading it for ourselves. Amen? We're not, uh, and we, like I said, I believe this morning, we only get a small portion each time we meet for a sermon, we, we get such a small portion from the scriptures. So if you're only reading the word of God on Sunday, or any time you come and sit under the preaching of God's word, you're missing out on a lot, aren't you? So if we're to walk worthy as adopted children of God, then we need to learn what God's expectation is for us. Learn what God's expectation is, and then take action and live it out in our lives. Amen? But you know what? As born-again believers, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to help us with that and to guide us as we work through the Word of God and as we apply the Word of God to ourselves. The Holy Spirit is there to help direct us so that we may walk worthy of being adopted into God's family. Turn back to, to uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. So we're adopted into God's family. In verse 12, we're partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, he says, God who hath delivered us from the power of darkness... We're to walk worthy because God has not only adopted us into his family, but he has delivered us, delivered us from the darkness of this world. In other words, he's delivered us from the power of sin and death and misery. Because really, that's what it is. When you have no hope, when you don't have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, when you're living apart from God... You know, that, that life will lead to destruction, and it's a life without hope. It's a life that can only be based on the, the uh, pleasure and whatnot that we get out of this world right now. But God has delivered us from the darkness of this present world. Look at Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Acts 26 and verse 15, verse 14 says, And when we were all fallen to the earth, Paul's giving testimony here of his salvation experience. It says, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon my feet, he says, For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of 
these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. So God is telling Paul that he's, uh, may, you know, he's confronted him here and he says, I'm going to make you a minister. You're going to serve me. You're going to be a witness of the works that Jesus did and those things which, Paul, which Jesus did on the road to Damascus with Paul directly, as well as uh, the things that he would reveal unto him, the things that Paul would go on to preach and teach. But in verse number 18, it says, to open their eyes and to turn them from what? From darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. Oh, this is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking to Baal on the road to Damascus. And he tells them, your, your job is going to be, go, tell, tell the gospel, share the gospel, give testimony and witness of what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary, that you might give hope to those that need it, those that are lost and dying in their sins. The unsaved world that is living in darkness he says, I will give you the truth so that you can witness to them so that may they, they may have the opportunity to be delivered from that darkness into light. Look at Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And verse 12 Paul says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light and let us walk honestly as in the day, not in riding and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. So we've been delivered from darkness to to light, and so therefore, put on the light, he says here. Ephesians chapter 2. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. In verse 2, Paul describes us before we were saved, as he says here, where in time past you walked according to the course of the world, According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation or our lifestyle in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now he's describing us living in darkness, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ has taken us and delivered us from that darkness of living in the world, living according to the flesh, living according to Satan's temptation and desires to living in the light, living for the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are to walk worthy of being not only adopted into God's family, but we're to walk worthy of being delivered from darkness. Well, what does that mean for us? How do we, how do we walk demonstrating, giving testimony to the fact that we've been delivered of, from darkness. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 8. Verse 7, he says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Just before that, he's referred to those that do not serve, do not worship the Lord Jesus Christ, do not worship God, they're not children of God, but he says in verse 8, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye what? Light in the Lord, so walk as children of the light. And then he mentions there in the next verse, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. In other words, if we're to walk as though... You know, walk, of, walk worthy of the fact that God has delivered us from darkness to light, then we ought to walk demonstrating that in our lives. In other words, we don't walk without hope, do we? 
That's how the unsaved world lives their life. They live for the moment. They live for what they can get out of life now. We're living for the future, amen? We're living because we have the hope that the unsaved world doesn't have. We have the hope in Jesus Christ. We have the hope of his return. We have the hope of knowing that we have a home in heaven. And with the assurance of it, you know, we, we studied this in 1 John. The letter of 1 John tells us that these things have been written that we may what? Know that we may have eternal life. We don't have to guess or wonder it. We may know and have confidence in it. And that's how we ought to walk if we're delivered from darkness, is we have confidence and we walk in confidence knowing that Jesus Christ has paid for our sins. And ultimately, we walk in righteousness. Do you know what it means to walk in righteousness? I know we say, okay, we get in the scriptures and we learn what it means to, to uh, walk in righteousness according to what the scriptures teach us. The Bible tells us to be conformed to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if we want to walk in righteousness, then look at, you know, examine the Lord Jesus Christ, learn about him, and... You know, study him so that you know, okay, this is the way Jesus behaved, this is the decisions he made, then I need to follow him as an example. So yes, that's the way to walk in righteousness, but you know how else we can walk in righteousness? Is to put up guardrails. Have you ever driven on, uh, on uh, country roads, especially windy country roads? There's a section where, uh, on the highway, they call the airline between um, Bang uh, Callis to Bangor. I don't know how many of you made of, may have made that trip across there. It's about an hour long to get from, but that whole highway, I mean, it's a long, there's a lot of deserted area along there where you just, you don't see anything. All you see is guardrails. And the road's windy, used to be worse than it is now. And, you know, those guardrails are important because they give you a visible measure of how to stay within the lane and stay safe. Because a lot of that road, if, you, if those guardrails weren't there and you wandered off the edge of the road, guess what? You're not just going to wind up in a field. Those ditches are deep and the trees are big and it's going to be a re you're going to be in real trouble if you go too far. Well, it's like that for us as born-again believers. In this world that we live in, a world that's filled with darkness, we need guardrails. So if we want to walk in righteousness, we need to put those guardrails up to give us a guide, to give us protection, so that we know what our limits are to maintain a testimony before God. That's what it means to walk in righteousness, to walk in light. We're to walk worthy because God has delivered us from darkness. And we ought to have a testimony in our lives that we walk as children of the light. And then the third reason that he gives us back in Colossians. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. He says in verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The third reason we're to walk worthy is the fact that we're to walk worthy because God has migrated us into his kingdom. Do you realize that even though we're residents of Canada, you know, I'm, I'm so glad that I was born in Canada, amen? We think of the country and, and, you know, the countries we come from, where those countries are near and dear to our hearts. But we're, you know, we, we may be residents, but the scriptures tell us that we are pilgrims in this land. Having been born, you know, here on the East Coast in Nova Scotia, that, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. I say born in Nova Scotia. I feel like I was born in Nova Scotia. I was actually born in Montreal, but... We moved down there so, so young, I think I was six when we moved to Nova Scotia, that, and my parents both grew up there. So Nova Scotia is near and dear to my heart because that's where I spent a big chunk of my childhood, right up until I 
went off to college. Now that I think about it, I think I've been away from Nova Scotia longer than I lived there. But it's still special because it's that, you know, I don't remember Montreal. Nova Scotia is that, I feel like it's that, that place of my birth. Maybe I consider myself adopted there. <laughs> Needless to say, you know, it's special. And when, when we go to Nova Scotia, we, we feel right at home, especially, you know, particularly down the eastern shore where we grew up. It, it's familiar, it's comfortable, uh, you know, you, we, we know a lot about it. But God has translated us or migrated us. He's, he's transferred us from that place which used to be comfortable into his kingdom. Now, I know we're not living in God's kingdom yet, but the day is coming, amen? And I hope you're looking forward to it. But what it tells us in the scriptures is that, guess what? As much as there's things in this old world that we, God wants us to enjoy. You know, we look around us. I love living on Jones Lake here. We're very fortunate. Yeah, I can, in fact, I... I Feel like I'm in rural Nova Scotia just by sitting on our front step there and looking at the lake in the summer. It's so quiet, and I can imagine that I'm out, out in the woods uh, on a big lake all by myself by sitting on our porch. So praise the Lord for that. We enjoy that. But you know what? As, mu as much as we can enjoy those things, this is no longer our home. Don't get too attached to it. Enjoy what God has given to us. But God has translated us. He's made us pilgrims. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And in verse 11, he says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as what? Strangers and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You know, he's describing these born-again believers as strangers and pilgrims to this, you know, worldly earth. This is not our natural home anymore. And yes, we've been born on this earth, I understand that. But don't get attached to it. Not only are we strangers and pilgrims, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he tells us that on this earth we're, we are ambassadors. 2 Corinthians. And of course, what is an ambassador? An ambassador is a a representative, we've talked about this before, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20, he says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. You know, we are God's representative, and that's because we've been translated to a new kingdom. This is our temporary home, and as our temporary home, we are to represent God here. But don't get too comfortable. Yes, we can enjoy it, and it's special to us while we're here. But are you looking forward to going to our real home, that home in heaven, to be a part of God's kingdom? He has migrated us to his kingdom. And we're to walk worthy of that. Well, how do we walk, walk worthy of being, you know, from another place? Well, we walk in such a way to represent that kingdom we've come from. That's why he says there we're, we're ambassadors. In other words, don't get comfortable. Don't, don't just blend in with the locals and try to kind of disappear into the fabric of the land. No, we want to stand out as God's representatives. Amen. We want to be a witness and a testimony for him. And so, therefore, we want people to look at us and say, you know what, there's something different about them. That's what it means to uh, walk in such a way to be an ambassador or re representative for the Lord Jesus Christ, is to walk in such a way that people will say, you know what, there's something different about that person. He doesn't act and talk and behave like the world does. He doesn't handle situations the same way. 
And that's because we have God as our Father, Jesus Christ as our Savior, and the Holy Spirit as our guide. Are you walking worthy of the witness that God has made us through the Lord Jesus Christ? Causes us, should cause us to stop and think of our daily behavior, shouldn't it? And when we think about this passage, it should guide us in not just the way we behave when we come to church, but in everything we do, our work, our play, our travel, whatever it is we do. We are different because of our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk worthy of that. Walk worthy so that God will look upon us and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've represented me well. That's God's desire for us. Is that your desire to please God in that way? I trust that it is. Father, we thank you for our time tonight. And again, as we think of the word of God and how we are to walk worthy of the relationship we have with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to do that daily. And yes, Lord, we need help every day to maintain that testimony for you because the flesh is strong and the temptation is there to keep us from having a, a good witness for you. And so, Lord, we, we depend upon you for strength, for guidance. We depend upon the Holy Spirit to help us live each day being a witness and testimony for you. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to do that day by day. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Let us take our hymn books one more time. And we are going to close with number 340. That is 340. Near, still near. If we want to have a good witness for God, a good testimony of our life, then we need to be drawing near to him all the time. Amen? Amen. Let us stand and we'll close with verse 1 and verse 4. Verse 1 and verse 4. striving to get near to the Lord and have a witness and testimony for him. Thank you for joining us tonight for our service. We're grateful that you're able to be here. And Stephen, would you close in a word of prayer for us tonight, please?